Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about India spice roots, and uh, some of you had the experience in Cochin yesterday. We went on the spice root excursion, and uh, wonderful excursion, one of the best ones I think I've ever had. Um, we've got a consultation going on over here with Gonzalo. Um, <laughs> uh, and we want to talk a little bit about that today, about Cochin and some of the other areas that have been part of the spice roots. This afternoon, we will sort of take this to the next step. We've got a series of these that are kind of interlinked. Today, we talk about the spice roots and how that all began. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about the East India companies, the East India companies being the efforts by the European powers, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and the British, to then control the spice roots in this part of the world. And then we'll talk about British India because they're the ones that ended up winning that, that war with the other European powers and controlling India especially, but other areas of, this, of the world here as well. And then we'll go on to Gandhi and India's struggle for independence, tea and cricket, and then understanding Islam, okay? Um, the, I wanna start by going back to something you may have heard of, and that is the Silk Road. The Silk Road is, and this is all going to tie in eventually, trust me. The Silk Road was the first major globalization of the planet. It was the effort, there was no one Silk Road. In fact, the title Silk Road did not occur until the 19th century, and it was quoted by a 19th century archaeologist and ex sort of uh, explorer named Ferdinand von Richthofen. If that name sounds familiar to you, he was the uncle of the Baron von Richthofen of uh, the famous World War I German flying ace. So Ferdinand von Richthofen in the 19th century referred to this as the Silk Road, but he did not intend, it, intend to mean one road. There were many, many different routes that were part of the Silk Road effort. Um, it's the main connecting artery that developed some, starting in the third century BC during the time of the Han Chinese dynasty and expanded over time and actually had two phases, one from about 250 BC to about 300 AD, and then it kind of uh, slacked off for a long period of time and then picked back up later on and existed for several hundred years, ending finally about 1450. It ended because it no longer really was necessary, but the interesting thing is there now is a concerted effort, especially on the part of China, to reestablish some of the same kinds of things, activities and whatnot that were happening during the Silk Road. Um, this is a map of some of the major land Silk Road routes, and you will notice that some of them come down via land to um, India. We're going to talk about some of the land routes that came down to India, but more particularly later on I'll bring in the Maritime Silk Road, or what sometimes has been called the Spice Routes. Um, the camels that we have here, the Bactrian camels, this is an example from a caravanserai, a caravanserai. A caravanserai was a meeting place where these, these camel caravans would travel across Asia, Central Asia, Europe, all the way into uh, the eastern part of Europe. Eventually, the major cities in the Roman Empire in Western Europe benefited from all this. There was an enormous desire on the part of the Romans, for instance, in their heyday, in the first century BC, first century AD, which falls right in the strongest time of the first phase of the Silk Road, for all the products that were coming out of the Far East. The Roman women um, believed that having silk garments, and silk only came from China at that point. The Chinese were very protective of how silk was produced. In fact, one of the, the Roman historians said it's produced by gathering this wool-like material that grew on trees and then weaving it together. They had no idea that it was made by worms. Uh, it was only much later that people were able to sneak silkworms into uh, further west. But in Rome, all of the women wanted to wear these gowns. They wanted to uh, have the spices for food. They wanted to have various other luxury items, the ceramics that came from China. And so there was a point at which one of the senators in Rome complained that the equivalent, of, well, we, what would be the, for us the equivalent of about a billion dollars a year of Roman coins were being sent to the East to purchase all of these luxury items. And there were others who complained about women wearing these, and they, they loved the very filmy silk garments, uh, you know, very thin, and that women wearing these silk garments, that every man in the neighborhood knew, it, uh, knew the woman's body as well as her husband did. 
So there, were, there was a huge factor in Rome and in various other major Western cities that all came about uh, because of this Silk Road trade that occurred here. Again, camels were the most common way in which this was done by land. Horses were not practical because of the very rough terrain and the long distances. Camels are especially adapted to traveling in this part of the world, and uh, the, they were very, very effective. They could go longer without water or food. They could carry much more weight. At times, there were caravans of as many as 10,000 camels that would come from the far east, traveling west. Now, none of them, have, and it started over here, the capital cities of Han, of, um, Han China, and traveled up to what's called the, um, the Hexi Corridor or the Ganzu Corridor. And here, there is a, an area called the uh, Tarim Basin. It's a depression, a desert, the Taklamakan Desert. And there were various towns that were primarily trading posts that surrounded either the north or the south of the desert. And then all of this activity here in the area known as Farana and Bactria, um, and then oh, further over. Now, no, no caravans ever went all the way from the Far East to the Far West. They would go so far and then trade their goods to somebody else. And then those people would, would take those goods and go further west, and they would trade them for something else. So you always had two or three or four or five middlemen. The reason why Christopher Columbus and Vasco, uh, Vasco da Gama and all of these people were trying to get directly to India was they knew they could do it cheaper if they didn't have to pay all these middlemen. And so that was part of the reason everyone wanted to gain control directly of the various commodities, spices and silk and other things from this part of the world so that they didn't have to end up paying all of the additional uh, add-ons that people charged as they carried it across through there. Um, this is a geographical picture of this part of the world, uh, we, we're down here, of course, on our way to Sri Lanka. One of, the, one of the realities that caused the need for the development of specific Silk Road, I mean, why did they have to start doing something intentional? Why didn't they just trade? Well, this is why. The geography of this part of the world creates a very harsh barrier. These are the tallest mountains in the world. The Himalayas, you also get the area of the Hindu Kush. Uh, various other mountain ranges, the uh, Altai and others in here. This is the, I mentioned the depression, the Tarim Basin, that is the Taklamakan Desert. It's a quite inhospitable desert. So China over here was geographically cut off from the rest of the world. And so really did not have any interaction with the rest of the world until a few centuries BC, the early centuries BC, uh, particularly in the second century BC. Um, the, this became key, uh, the, there were towns built all along here to create the locations for the trade, the exchange, and we're talking about exchange in, um, in silks, spices, precious stones, silver, um, horses, and camels. China especially had a desire for horses. The, I mentioned before that the grass in China was insufficient to, uh, to breed strong horses. I've read that it was primarily a potassium deficiency that they had, and so the horses that they, they bred in China were not strong enough to carry a rider. It took four, at least four horses just to pull a chariot. And compared to that, up north in these areas of Mongolia, where there were the nomadic tribesmen, they had terrifically powerful horses. They were not very large, but they were very fast and very tough. They could run all day um, and, and do very, very well, and so the Chinese really wanted those horses. There's, there's a, a line that you might draw right along here. And it's very important to understand that in that, throughout much of history, there have been two very distinct cultures, north and south of, of a dividing line. North of anywhere along here, in the areas of Mongolia, you have a nomadic herdsman uh, culture. They would raise horses and, and cattle, uh, goats, sheep, but they would move from place to place depending upon where the water was, where the feed was, etc. They did not settle, they did not grow crops other than in rare occasions. There were certain seasons of the year in certain areas they might grow short crops, but compared to that, down here in the south, it was all a settled agrarian culture. They did not wander from place to place. They built cities, they lived in one place, they grew crops. Well, in both of those cases, each of those types of uh, ways of life lacked something. 
In the north, they did not have grains. They did not have a lot of the foodstuffs that they really needed. They didn't have manufactured products. Ceramics, for instance, they did not have uh, technology for ceramics. So they were always wanting those things. In the south, they wanted the cattle for food. They wanted the horses for military reasons to protect themselves. There was always something that the other side of this line had that they wanted. And in the case of the northern nomads, since they were very powerful militarily because of their, their horse, their cavalry, then they were always, um, if they couldn't trade, they would raid. And this became a constant problem for China. That's sort of the line I'm talking about there. This graph gives you an idea, and I've talked about some of these already, and we'll look at them again. Um, We've spoken about talking about Northern India, the Mauryan uh, Empire, the Guptas, and the Mughals as being three major empires that occurred in the subcontinent of India. Those are the three empires that uh, were all larger than the current Republic of India. So they were very significant. There's another group called the Kushans that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, but I need to sort of lead up to that. Um, the, this chart is, you could study this for ages. Uh, we're going to talk about the Zhongnu. We're going to talk about the Kushans and the relationship there. Particularly, there was a period of time during the, Rome, the uh, Silk Road time, the first period from about 200 BC, maybe a little earlier, 250 BC, to around 400 uh, CE, where the Roman Empire, the Parthian Empire, which was a Persian Empire, the Han Dynasty in China, and the Kushan were the most important of the empires that existed. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Kushan Empire? I right, I thought so. Well, my wife raises her hand, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> She's heard my lectures. Um, but these four empires, Rome, the, the Roman Empire, the Han Dynasty of China, the Parthian Persian Empire, and the Kushan Empire at one time were the four most important empires in the world. And I'm going to go back to the Kushan because I have to lead up to it. You have to understand something about where they came from. Um, as I say, the biggest problem that Han China had was that they needed to trade with the uh, nomadic tribes in the north, but the nomadic tribes in the north, if they didn't feel like trading, they would raid. They were much more powerful militarily. Their horses made a difference. They were very powerful um, nom nomadic horsemen. They had developed a very powerful, short, compound bow. It was made by, by gluing together uh, wood, sometimes leather and bone. They had mastered this technology so that one of these short bows was as powerful as the English longbows we were, which were over six feet long. Um, very, very powerful. They, could, they were tremendously effective from horseback uh, firing these, uh, these arrows. And they did develop early on a kind of stirrup I think I mentioned before the problem with some of the ancient empires is they didn't have stirrups. Imagine riding a horse and trying to shoot a bow accurately without a stirrup. At first, they just started using loops of leather that they could brace themselves on. But um, the primary, you have Han Dynasty of China down here. In the north, there were two significant tribes, the Zhongnu and the Weizi. There was a third tribe, the, the Wusan, that sort of played around the perimeters. I'm not really going to get into them. There are, let me just tell you, dozens of various ancient empires and dynasties that you probably, unless you really studied this, have never heard of. Uh, the Dacians, the Sogdians, the Scythians, the, the uh, Hephthalites, the White Huns, the, on and on and on. These, we know very little about all these history. I'm only giving you the three or four most important ones. Well, the Han Dynasty found themselves confronted with the Zhongnu and the Weizi. The Weizi didn't give the Chinese very much trouble. They were the most powerful, the Weizi, and they were a nomadic people, a horse people as well. They, for a long time, were the most powerful. They had uh, 200,000 armed horsemen, and they, uh, very, very powerful, they would defeat the Zhongnu. The Zhongnu actually had more uh, people, but they were broken up into small tribes. They were not organized as well as the Weizi. And so the Weizi were dominant, and the Weizi would, would uh, <coughs> defeat the Wusan and take their land away from them. They take land away from the Zhongnu. They mostly left Han China alone. They were doing some trading. But eventually, oh, and I should say that the Zhongnu did give a terrible time uh, to the Han. 
the Great Wall of China was primarily built in order to keep the Xiongnu and other, some other nomadic tribes as well, keep them out so that they wouldn't be constantly raiding. We have many cases, these are cases where there were attacks by the Xiongnu. Uh, they built the wall to protect the various areas that eventually became the, the Silk Road. Um, the Xiongnu actually in 177 BC invaded and established themselves on the other side of the Great Wall, but that's why it was built, is to keep these people out. I don't know if you've seen the Matt Damon movie, The Wall, about the Great Wall of China. They said it was to keep out these sort of giant serpent kind of creatures. <laughs> the visuals in that are spectacular, but don't believe the story, okay? Don't get your history from, from movies. Well, eventually the Xiongnu, under a guy named Chang Yu Modu, he managed to get all of the Xiongnu tribes together. He unified all of the forces so that they then were the largest and most powerful. Then they no longer are just interested in doing minor raids into China. They actually come down and they defeat the Wusun and the Huizi, who previously had been the most powerful. They defeat them, they have four wars with the Huizi, and then the fourth one, they so thoroughly defeat them, they drive them out and force them to travel considerably to the west, along with the Wusun. Now, they defeat them so soundly that they kill the king of the Weizi and, and the king of the Xiongnu at that point takes the skull of the Weizi king and turns it into a drinking cup. Ooh, Apparently that was what you did when you defeated the king of a, of a hated enemy at those days. So this is a case where the Xiongnu now have almost complete power and control in this part of the world and they're a huge threat to the Chinese. The Han keep trading with them, in fact for a long period of time, the Han Dynasty in China was paying tribute to the Xiongnu. They would give princesses from the royal house of the Han Dynasty as wives for the kings and, and primary leaders of the Xiongnu. They would uh, pay tribute to them, enormous amounts of, of silver. Um, gold wasn't as common in that part of the world at that time, but jade was used. Um, uh, they would, would give them crops. There was less trade going on at that point than there was an effort by the Chinese to simply keep the Xiongnu from deciding to just come in and completely invade. So it was a great problem for the Chinese. They decided they needed to do something about it after the Xiongnu chased the, uh, the Huizi, who had been the most powerful in this region, chased them to the west. The Chinese ended up sending a, an envoy to try to find them. And I, I've got a, a couple of little sidebars in here. The Xiongnu, it's believed, we don't have a consistent history on all this stuff, they didn't write it down, that eventually the Xiongnu uh, not only came down into China some, but they also uh, began to move over into even Western Europe, and that they became what was known as the Huns. That Attila the Hun, who died in 453 uh, AD, that he was the uh, descendant of some of the rulers of the Xiongnu, and that the Huns were actually the uh, Xiongnu in a later form. That they came across, they conquered much of Western Europe, they created the land that we know as, of as Hungary, and the reason why some of these areas of Eastern Europe were especially attractive to them is because they were still horsemen, horse, the people of horses, and they found these open areas in, West, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe where they could graze their horses, and it was good grazing land for them. It's believed that uh, whatever, whether the Xiongnu really were the uh, antecedents to the Huns or not, that this migration of the Huns over is what caused the start of what's called the Great Migration, which means various of the, um, what were later called barbarians, which simply in Greek meant that they, you couldn't understand them, they barbled, you know, they didn't speak Greek, in other words, that these various barbarian tribes uh, all started moving west. You've got the, you know, the Lombards and the Huns and the um, Goths, Visigoths, Astrogoths, all these other tribes began to move to the west and this began the age called the Great Migration, which led to the fall of Rome. You notice Attila died in 453, where Rome def uh, finally fell, the last Roman emperor in Rome, that is the Western Roman Emperor, where Constantinople was the Eastern Roman Empire, and it continued for another thousand years. But in the West, the last emperor died in, uh, or was, uh, was dethroned, you know, he was no longer emperor in 476. So this was the start of the Dark Ages in Western Europe because of the great migration of these various barbarian tribes, which we believe may have been uh, initiated by the Huns traveling over, and that may have been the Xiongnu we're talking about then. Well, as I mentioned, 
backing up a little bit, after um, Cheng Yu Modu got all of the Xiongnu together and they were, they were a real threat to the Han Empire, the Han said, well, you remember the Weizi, that tribe that used to be here that got chased off? If we join forces with them, then maybe we would have enough to be able to defeat the Xiongnu. So they sent a very important man. He was a, an ambassador from the royal house of the Han Dynasty named Jiang Qian. Jiang Qian was sent to find the Weizi and ask them to come back and fight with the Han Dynasty against the Xiongnu. So he travels to the west and ended up making two trips. The first one took him 10 years because he got captured by the Xiongnu. They forced him to stay there. They, they gave him a wife to marry. He had kids. But then eventually he decided, you know, they might be looking for me back in Han China. So he, uh, after being up in the capital of the Xiongnu, he came back and he brought reports about all the things he had seen because he had traveled far enough that he actually had some contact with the Roman Empire. And he came back and was telling all these stories about these other nations and the goods that they had and all of the, all of the potential there was in those areas. In particular, <coughs> I mentioned the Chinese desire for horses. Well, there's an area in, called Fergana up in here. They were especially famous for their horses. In fact, the Chinese came to call these the heavenly horses. They actually call them the heavenly horses that sweat blood because for some phenomena that's not exactly understood now, the horses, when they exerted themselves, when they ran, their perspiration would be red. Either it was something they ate or that they would break small blood vessels when they exerted themselves, but they became known as the heavenly horses that sweated blood. And the, the uh, emperors of the Han Dynasty developed this absolute unsatiable desire to get some of these horses. They were so powerful that the legend was they had been bred from dragons. Oh, wow. So they wanted, they wanted horses, but they wanted the very best horses, which were from up in here. And so that's one of the reasons the emperors of the Han Dynasty decided, we gotta, we got to go find out more about what's going on. They actually, about the heavenly horses, they sent two military campaigns, two armies, to try to go and capture some of these horses. Both of the armies suffered terrible defeats, and I, they ended up bringing back two or three horses. I mean, it was like, it was a huge failure. Well, the Wei Zi that uh, Zhang Qin, and by the way, if you go into to China today, Zhang Qin, you'll see statues of him. He is considered one of the great heroes in Chinese history to this day, um, as the one who opened up the connection between the Chinese and the Western world. Well, he never found the Wei Zi. Well, he found them, but they didn't agree to come back. Uh, they actually, had been driven, as the Weizi, they had been driven by the Xiongnu further west and north. They actually had some conflict with the Wusun. They traveled south through Sogdiana, Sogdia, and then further south through Bactria. And eventually, sometime around the first century BC, they split up into five different tribes, five different families. Finally, in um, the right around the turn of the millennia, one of the leaders of one of the families, the family of the Kushana, that was one of the five Weizi families, he ended up doing what uh, Chen Yumodu had done for the, Zhang, uh, the Zhongnu, and he got everybody back together again. And because their family name was Kushanas, it was called the Kushan Empire. Eventually, having come down from Fergana and taken over all of Bactria, the area, this is what we know as Afghanistan, this is uh, Pakistan, and this is India. You will remember I told you about the Mauryan Empire, the largest empire ever in the history of India, that their capital was uh, Padalaputra, right there. And that this area, which is the Yangtze River Basin, was very fertile. Well, the Kushan Empire not only conquered everything, uh, Bactria, all the way up to the Tarim Basin, they controlled this area so they were touching China, all of what we know of as Pakistan, much of Afghanistan, and most of northern India, which was very, very fertile, very important. And yet you've never heard of them. Now they were especially important because there were at that time, and we're talking first, second century AD now, one of the four most important and powerful empires in the world. There, of course, in the Mediterranean Basin, we had the Roman Empire. In the Far East, the Han Empire existed until um, the start of the third century AD, um, in, the, in the 200s. 
the Parthian Empire, which was a, uh, had developed out of the Persian empires, and the Kushan Empire. And they were especially important because they were the major middlemen in the Silk Road trade. From the Han Empire, they would follow these routes up around the Taklamakan Desert, which is also called the, the, Tarim, uh, the uh, Tarim Basin. These various cities, Merv, Kashgar, Bukhara, were major trading centers. And then some of the routes would come down to, to Bagram, and you'll notice that there are roads that led down into India as well. They would, they controlled almost all of these major cities at that point, all the way up into the Taklamakan Desert. And so they would take the goods and then trade them, and they became very wealthy because of that. They also controlled the important, useful parts uh, in the north of India. So I'm going to talk about these maritime routes in just a minute. So they were very, very important in that regard. This is another view of it. The Roman Empire, the Parthian Empire, the Kushan Empire, and the Han Empire. And again, the Kushan Empire controlled most of northern India. This also identifies some of the uh, products, silk, perfume, spices, tortoise shell, pearls, pepper, this Malabar coast, you know, Malabar pepper from the, the, where we have just been was very important. Pepper was a, one of the primary things they were looking for, and it was very expensive back then. Um, it was used for medicine. It was used as a condiment. It was also used, and we were talking about that, is it was very effective in covering up meat that was going bad. <laughs> so they would use it pretty heavily on questionable meat, and that way people could get it down. Um, you also have muslin. Over and you'll notice that the the area for those of you who continued on from Athens to Dubai and then and then from there, the area of the Red Sea, myrrh, frankincense. This what's called the incense coast here. All of that was part of this trade route. Now, here in India, we have major again the Tarim Basin. This uh, Kushan Empire was all in here. We have major roads that come down, but even more importantly, in the case of India there were maritime connections. And there really were two reasons for that, well, three reasons for that. One, there, there came a point later on in which the, um, the Ottoman Empire comes into power, and they will not allow trade to cross from the east into Europe. And so they were looking for other ways to get around that. And one of the ways they could get around it was by sea. Even earlier than that, though, they discovered that there were areas in sea, um, over, over in here, where we're going to be going, where we, when we get over into um, the Malaysia, even further into Indonesia, what were called the Spice Islands, a lot of these are islands. There was no land route that you could go and pick this stuff up, and so they had to have sea lanes as well. And they, so they developed sea lanes in order to, to take advantage of some of the things that were really desirable in the West that they couldn't, couldn't access by land. And finally, as, as this, the Silk Road trade continued to expand and expand, they increased the size of the loads, and they also started trading things that were not, even camels had trouble carrying. When you're talking about you know, metal ore or ceramics, you know, there's only so much of that you can put on the back of a camel, but you can put a whole lot of it in a hold of a ship. And so for all of those reasons, because of limitations on some of the land routes, particularly over as you get into the Ottoman Empire um, in, later on, then also because of the weight of some of the things they were transporting and the need they had to access some of the Spice Islands. And again, you'll see here Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka as we know it today, and then all along this Malabar coast up to what we, talk, we call um, Mumbai today, it's been Bombay, over and all along, this is the incense route here, this is the Persian Gulf where we all started right there in uh, modern day Dubai, and so all of this were major trade routes, trading in cinnamon, cassia, cardamom, incense, ginger, turmeric, and especially pepper. Uh, and Kerala, where we were just were uh, in Cochin, which is a city in the state of Kerala, Kerala is known to have been trading in spices before all of this, as far back as 3000 BC. We have evidence that Kerala was a primary source for many of those kinds of spices and things that people wanted. Another major player, by the way, and this is another side note, um, in Africa, in what we know of as Ethiopia today, and also part of Sudan, there was a kingdom called the Kingdom of Aksum. 
Have any of you all ever been to Ethiopia and seen like in Lalabella to see the stone chapels? Lalabella was a honey eater. He was one of the kings of the Aksum Empire and later, uh, and, and, and which influenced later on. The Aksum Empire in Ethiopia was one of the world's great empires then. It didn't affect the Silk Road uh, in terms of trade, but they were a very significant force in Africa. And most people don't think of Ethiopia having been a major world empire at that time. We also had greater Zimbabwe. We had you know, various other um, major civilizations that existed in Africa that in their day were very sophisticated, uh, much more sophisticated than most of Western Europe. We, we have a real problem, I think most of us in the West that are descended from, from European cultures, of thinking that anything that was ever really advanced or really good, it was ours. And yet there were empires in Africa and in parts of Asia, areas that we do not think of as very advanced or developed nowadays, that in their day were very significant. Eventually, after, after much of this, um, after the rise of the Arab Empire, the Arabs became some of the primary traders. The Kingdom of Aksum was involved in that. Some of the people from the Roman Empire were uh, beginning to continue through the Red Sea and other places to try to get around the Ottoman Empire as much as they could. And then, in the 1100s and 1200s, we have the phenomena of the Mongol Empire. Uh, the, the Genghis Khan, or Chinggis Khan, which is a more appropriate... Uh, <laughs> People are, I, I'm getting a thank you. I did know that he's, that more officially now, he's called Chinggis Khan. If you go to Mongolia or China, they will refer to him as Chinggis Khan. But I always have to be careful because I use words like that and they go, oh, was, was he related to Genghis Khan? You know, uh, so yeah, Chinggis is a better translation of his name. This is a photograph of uh, Chinggis Khan. No, it's just a later uh, representation of what he might have looked like. They didn't have any contemporary portraits. Four of his sons, Yoki was the oldest son, Chagatai was second, uh, Ogadai, and then Tolbi, and then two of his grandsons, Hulegu, and perhaps the most important, the Kublai Khan. You know, Kublai Khan and his pleasure palace and all of that. Well, they controlled all of, uh, from the Pacific Ocean, all of the China, eventually they came out of Mongolia, controlled China, all of Central Asia. They didn't get down into India, but they did take over much of what had been the, uh, well, all of the Parthian Empire, all the way over into uh, Europe. And this is the largest contiguous empire in the history of the world. The only empire at all that was larger than this was the British Empire, but it was, of course, spread out all over the planet. And so you add all that together, and it was larger than the Mongol Empire, but the Mongol Empire is the largest contiguous. Well, what happened in the 11 and 1200s, uh, Genghis Khan conquered, uh, or Genghis Khan conquered most of this. He notably, while the Mongol armies were ruthless, they, if, if a city resisted them, it was not uncommon for them to kill everyone. There are areas of the Iranian plateau, uh, which was Persia at that time, which had a large population, half of which were killed. There were areas in the Mesopotamia that they had had um, fairly sophisticated irrigation systems for a long, long time. And when, when uh, at that point, it was Hulegu Khan who came through there, he destroyed the city of Baghdad and ended the Golden Age of Islam. They destroyed much of the irrigation in Mesopotamia, and it's never been replaced uh, in many areas. So there was a lot of destruction. But in addition to all the destruction, and it's believed that the, that the conquering of the Mongol Empire uh, ended up in more deaths than any other, you know, single source or event in history. Um, there were tens of millions of people who died from this. That, however, for all of that, uh, Chinggis Khan was tolerant of many different religions. He maintained his own religion, which was a polytheistic religion out of Mongolia, but um, he, they did, had not had their own script before, their own writing system. Well, he encouraged the development of a writing system that the Mongol uh, Empire could use he supported trades and crafts. In fact, when he comes along in the 1200s, while the Silk Road still continued for a couple hundred more years after that, it really, the reason it finally died out is because it became uh, redundant. There no longer were any barriers. You know, the, the Mongols had conquered all of it and it was all under fairly centralized control and so they were able to trade fairly freely. They no longer had the need for the previous organization because there was a new, uh, there was a new guy in town, a new organization. Um, and Chinggis Khan also provided a, a law code that was for the entire empire that was specifically based upon the, the 
the moralities and expectations of the Mongols, but very effective. After Chinggis Khan's death, they con continued with much of the conquest, um, and they, but they broke up amongst his sons and grandsons into four primary Khanates, they're called. Um, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, and they, they ended up conquering much of Russia, for instance. The Il Khanate, which means the second Khanate, because the, the, uh, the leaders of the Il Khanate for several generations, they were willing to say, we will accept the rulership of the Great Khan, which ended up being Kublai Khan. He was supposed to be number one. Then the Golden Horde, the uh, Chagatai Khanate, which was from the, the uh, second son, and then the Il Khanate. All of them were supposed to be under the authority of the one that the Great Khan, but very shortly after Chinggis Khan's death, they became quite independent. The Great Khan became Kublai Khan. He united all of Tibet and all of China and ended up being one of the most important times in Chinese history, it was the period under the Mongol rulership of the Kublai Khan. With the Silk Road and the, um, then the Mongol Empire, much of that led to the ages of exploration because after this, there was still trade going on, as I said, from spices and all sorts of things, but the Western powers got tired of paying somebody else to pay somebody else to pay somebody else to get the things they wanted. So they began the age of exploration, which began in Portugal under Henry the Navigator in the 15th century. They began to travel and explore um, particularly Vasco da Gama was the first who went all the way around the Horn of Africa, over here, and came up and, and visited India. Some of you the other day saw what had been his first burial place in uh, what's now a uh, Anglican church, but he was buried there for a number of years and then was exhumed and his body was taken back and is now buried in Lisbon, but there's the previous burial place. Um, he's not still there and in Lisbon, you know. <laughs> that is, was it this cruise I told the story about Mark Twain and the two skulls? That he went to a museum in Europe and, he, and he, he, at that point he stopped trusting museums because that museum had two skulls of Christopher Columbus, one of Columbus as a child and one of Columbus as an adult. <laughs> so, so we're pretty sure that Vasco da Gama is only buried in Lisbon, he's no longer buried in Cochin. Um, but this gives you an idea of some of the um, there were still the land routes, the Silk Road land routes, and this image down here gives you a focus on that. And some of the things that they were trading, horses and ceramics and spices and camels and, uh, and all kinds of, uh, then incense over here along the southern coast. But there also were these very important uh, maritime Silk Road, as it's called, or the spice routes, they're sometimes called. And they visited many of the places that, that we have been. I mean, we're following that route to a great extent from up here in the Persian Gulf, around to Mumbai, down the coast, and now this city, Moziri, we're no longer sure where that was, but it was in Kerala, it's right along the area we've been to, to Sri Lanka, and then we'll be going over to areas in um, Malaysia, the Malacca area, and Singapore, all of them were trading centers for spices and other things. So this is how um, all of that got started, and then in the late 1400s, there was the effort by the European powers, starting with Vasco da Gama, and actually a couple years before him, Christopher Columbus, thinking he was going to get to India by going the other direction, not knowing how far it was, discovered the Caribbean, you know, the New World, discovered it for Europeans. I always have to say there were other people there, you're not the first. And he called it the West Indies. And he named the people Indians. Well, this is all called the East Indies. And the reason is because of the confusion and Christopher Columbus thinking he had reached India and calling the people there Indians, they became the West Indies as opposed to the East Indies. This afternoon we're going to talk about the East Indies companies, East Indies companies, which were Portuguese, Dutch, French, British, all of them battling one another. And those of you who are in Cochin, we went to the Dutch Palace. Uh, or the, the, yeah, the Dutch Palace, which was built by the Portuguese. And a couple of people went, what? Why is the Dutch Palace built by the Portuguese? Because the Portuguese were there first, but then the Dutch drove them out, and they took over those facilities and usually expanded them. In Sri Lanka, we're going to see, uh, there's a large fort in Sri Lanka, in Gali, that um, was built, initially built by uh, the Dutch, and then ex uh, the Portuguese, and then expanded greatly by the Dutch later on. So you'll see a lot of that sort of thing. But this is what started that competition between the European powers. After the Mongol empires faded, 
the trade routes were no longer as secure and they decided why should we be either struggling or you know to get through all the land area because it's a long distance why don't we do it by sea and why don't we do it directly and that will lead us up to our conversation this afternoon about the east indies company okay any questions about any of that the spice route the silk road the spice route and silk road yes uh how long would a journey take from um, eastern china well, they wouldn't make that as one journey. Again, no one that we know of ever made the entire journey. They would go so far. Um, on a good day, a camel caravan could travel 50 kilometers. On a bad day, 25 kilometers. So that gives you some sense. It was months of travel to, to get that distance. But there was a period of time in the in the Roman Empire when the, they had roads that led to part of the Middle East, and they said that you could get from Rome to part of the Middle East uh, because of the roads. You could do it in uh, or into the edge of the of the Middle East in a week. You know, so the, some, the further east you got, the, the better the roads were. It was less desert. It was a little bit more pleasant climate. Then they could travel much more quickly. So there wasn't one. Some of this, when they were traveling over the mountains, you know, around the Tarim Basin, this is a, a very scary desert. In here, even though it looks like, oh, they had roads. Well, these are passes through the mountains, some of them the highest passes in the world. You know, the highest highways in the world now exist there. And so um, it obviously would be much slower going in here than it would be here, the Guns Reporter, or when they get over in here. So. The total time period, nobody ever made, the, made it consistently, but you'd be talking, if you did try to do it, it'd be months to get from one end to the other. Yes? Uh, two questions. How many pounds might a camel bear? And number two, what kind of payload might that be like in today's dollars? Okay, how much weight could a camel carry? And what would that amount to in terms of payload in today's terms? Well, let's see. Carry the one. <laughs> What's the lift weight of a sparrow? Um, I don't exactly know. I mean, it was hundreds of pounds that they could carry. They could carry two to three times as much, I know, as a horse could carry, and much more securely and further. Um, but it depended upon in terms of payload, depending on what they were carrying. Obviously, if, if they're carrying uh, pepper, was especially expensive, and it was much desired. That would have been much more valuable than, or silk, probably the most valuable of things they were carrying. They could carry quite a bit of silk. That would be much more valuable than if they were carrying, say, a, a ruder kind of ceramics, like pottery. Um, some of the expensive ceramics, later on, the Chinese were exporting the beautiful glaze and painted ceramics. You know the Chinese are famous for that. Um, then that would have been more expensive, but they discovered that camels were not the best way to transport breakable ceramics. Um, and so that's why ships came more into use for that sort of thing. So I really don't have an answer for you. I, I do know that they can carry hundreds of pounds, several hundred pounds, and that much more than a horse, and it depends entirely on what they were carrying, what the value of, of payload would be. Other questions? Yes? There's one. I, I know there's a, there's a route that goes up and over the Caspian Sea and into the Black Sea, and right. then we, we see a sea link across the Black Sea going down into Byzantium and into what is now Turkey or that, that Right. Uh, was that, was that route a diversion to get away from problems in the central corridor, or was that for a particular trade? Was that like for horses or whatever the case is? Well, I think they were always looking for new trade routes. Um, that was something, in the last trip, I did a talk about the Nabataeans, who were Arab traders, you know, Bedouin traders, that created the city of Petra and were famous in that area. They were, they were always pioneering new trade routes. Um, the primary routes were here around the Tarim Basin, but the, up through here, um, they did have routes that would go up, primarily intended to link with the Caspian Sea or the Black Sea. And, and you remind me of something. One of the other things that the, the Silk Road did was it was a primary pathway for disease. Uh, the Black Death was uh, traveled along this. And in fact, when I say that the um, the 1450s was the end of the, the Silk Road for the most part, uh, while well, 1450s is when the worst of the uh, Black Death epidemics occurred in Europe. 
and you'll notice that this path up here to the Black Sea, um, the Mongols are accused of being the first people in history to use germ warfare because they were assaulting a city on the north coast of the Black Sea that was a, a European city and it was fortified and they were besieging it and after a long period of time the, the, the plague hit the troops of the Mongols. Well, they started throwing the bodies of their dead soldiers, catapulting them over the walls the, in an attempt to spread whatever this was that was killing people. Well, what happened was the city still had access to the sea. So after this starts happening, they say, we're out of here. And they get on board their ships and they travel. This is in the 1450s. They traveled through the Black Sea, over into the Mediterranean, over into seaports. Everywhere they stopped, they had an epidemic of the Black Plague. And of course, you know, they, they would stop in a city in Eastern Europe, and then other ships would leave that port and go to other cities. Well, the late 1450s is when you have the very worst of the plagues in France, it hit England, and everything else, and all those are direct links to the shipping that occurred from the 1450s in the Black Sea after the Mongols introduced the Black Plague into a city on the Black Sea. So, yes, there were other trade routes that went up this way. They were not the dominant ones, and the reason is because these cities down here, Mer, Bukhara, um, Samarkand was down here, uh, Balt, these were major trading areas, and again, many of the people were interested in getting the goods as far as they could to make a good profit, selling it, turn around, going back. So they weren't trying to go the whole route, but there was a route that they could take up here around the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea as well. 